Let's look at Hosea chapter one. We're going to um, we're going to actually uh, the message tonight. I've chopped it in half because if I don't, it's going to be really long. Uh, so we're going to read the the whole first chapter here, and we'll really focus on the first um, verse. And then after we're done reading the whole first chapter, if you want to have uh, open to the last chapter of the book Hosea, chapter fourteen and verse nine, and just have. Your finger there. We're going to read. We're going to kind of read the. We're going to read the bookends of this book here, I guess. And so we'll we'll read the last, the first chapter and the last verse, beginning in Hosea chapter one, verse eleven. <coughs> Excuse me. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea the son of Beeri in the days of Uzziah, jo- Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed a great whoredom in departing from the Lord. Excuse me just a second. (coughs) Sorry, it must be contagious. You guys are coughing over there and I'm up here. All right, verse 3. So he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name Loruhamah, for I will have I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God. And I will not save them by bow or by sword nor by battle, by horses nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bare a son. And then, and then, then said God, call his name Loami, Loami, for ye are not my people and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the, <clears throat> in the place where it was said to them, ye are not my people, then uh, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a frog in my throat. <clears> throat> If I don't do something about it, I'm going to croak, right? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Sorry. I better hop to it. Okay. Uh, verse 11. Then the children of Israel... Uh, I'm sorry, then, then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. And if you look in the back of the book, Hosea 14... And verse 9, who is wise, and he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them, for the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Our Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word, and pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to understand it, and to behold wondrous things out of your law, and we pray, Lord, that you would help me as I as I preach uh, through the book of Hosea, I pray that you will help me to uh, say what you said, to bring out uh, your word, and, and I pray that you would change our lives through this study, and I pray that you'll bless the message here tonight in Jesus' name, amen. Excuse me, just a second, if I, <coughs> maybe if I get one good big one, and then... <clears throat> I ate an atomic fireball before I came here, and uh, that may be my issue. All right. And uh, all right. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about atomic fireball. Those, that's like the classic. All right. Okay. So, um, but we we live in a in a sin cursed world as we just read about there, and because of that, we're often faced with rather difficult and undesirable realities, and and uh, one of those realities that's so difficult and undesirable is divorce. Uh, And in most cases, the spouses no longer wish to speak to one another. Uh, There's too much pain. They they, they don't want to continue in that relationship. And they'd really uh, be happy if the other spouse was out of their lives 
uh, for good. That, that's not always the case, but that, that is many times the case. In, in the Old Testament, God married Israel. When, when God brought them out of, the, out of the land of Egypt and gave them the land of Canaan, God entered into a covenant with Israel. <clears throat> in, in that covenant, God took Israel and he made them his special people, his peculiar people. And in that covenant, God gave Israel his name. Uh, and they were going to be called now by his name. Um, and we, we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verses 9 and 10. Um, and it says, The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, then they shall be afraid of thee. Deuteronomy 29 verse 1 kind of recaps this and says, These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them at Horeb. This sounds like a marriage to me. Uh, Israel becomes God's people, and they're going to be called by God's name. And they do that arrangement in a covenant. All right? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so God pictures throughout the Old Testament his relationship to the children of Israel uh, as a husband and wife relationship. And we see echoes of that in the New Testament when we see the church as the bride of Christ. Right? Um, but uh, the book of Hosea, in the book of Hosea, God has to divorce his bride. He has to divorce Israel. And he has to do it because Israel is continuously unfaithful to him. Um, verse 7 of chapter 6 in Hosea, if you turn over there, we, we see the reason stated for us. It says in Hosea 6 and verse 7, but they like men, Israel like men, have transgressed the covenant. They're, they have dealt treacherously against me. Uh, and so they have this covenant with God and they have transgressed. They have broken their covenant vows. In chapter 2 and verse 2, um, the Bible says, Plead with your mother. Plead. For she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Um, and there was one more. There it is. Chapter 4. And this is where I take the title for the series. Chapter 4 and verse 1. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a great controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. And uh, a, a controversy here, what that really means is a legal a legal charge. There is God is bringing legal charges like in a court of law against Israel. And, and the way this has been laid out for us, it's like a divorce court and God is showing cause for, for divorce. And so I've entitled this, <clears throat> this uh, series, The Great Controversy. Now, it is not only about God's divorce from Israel, and we'll get into that. There's much, much more. This is actually a love story, um, but, it, but it is not a, a love story that is your typical Hallmark style, all right? Um, and, and there's a lot more substance to it. In spite, so Israel <clears throat> has transgressed, they've broken the covenant that they have with God, and God is divorcing them, he, he, or he has divorced them, and he is laying out charges uh, as to why he must do that. But in spite of Israel's adultery, in spite of the divorce, God still wants to speak to her. He's not done with her. It's not like so many divorces in, in uh, our, our lifetime today. And ultimately, God will restore her, and she will be his wife again. Um, and, and we see that really played out in chapter 1 and verse 10. Uh, and that first word in that verse is the word yet. Right? That's a, that's a big word. 
a big setting up a big contrast. He's just laid down the law. This is this is the judgment I'm bringing. This because you've been unfaithful. And he says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. That's the message of Hosea in a nutshell. You will be my wife again, he says. And, and even though you've, you've um, transgressed the covenant, even though you've been unfaithful to me, you'll be my wife again. And to illustrate that message, God commands his prophet Hosea to marry a woman who will repeatedly commit adultery. And she'll do it so much that, that well, she's taking payment for it. Uh, and then when that fails, she's just, for lack of a better term, doing that for fun. Uh, and eventually there's a divorce and eventually she ends up degrading herself into slavery. It's really bad. Her sexual sin becomes so persistent that Hosea has to divorce her and let her go. But God later on commands Hosea to love like he loves. God says, go and love in the way that I love. And to restore his wife to himself. So in chapter 3 and verse 1, we see that command given. Uh, and then said the Lord unto me, <clears throat> Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord, toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. And so God is saying, love according to the love of the Lord. Love as I love. God says. And the way I love is I love this people, this wife that I betrothed to myself who goes constantly after other gods. And if you love like I love, you will love this wife that is constantly going after other men. Uh, and you will restore her to yourself. And before Hosea could fully restore his wife to himself, he had to deal with her problem. He had to correct two things. One, he had to correct her bondage. She had fallen into slavery, and Hosea had to purchase her freedom. He does that in chapter 3, verse 2. And, and then he had to com correct her immorality. She, he, he needed to find a way to help her to quit her adulteries, and he will do that, and we'll get, we'll get to all that when, when the time comes. So he had to deal with those two things, and he did that... <clears throat> He was able to do that because he had such a great unconditional love for his wife. To love how God loves is to love people that hurt you. Is, is to love people even as they mistreat you. And not as the world teaches to stand up for yourself and get yours. That's the opposite of Christian love. This is how God loves and, and, and it is a good thing this is how God loves because if he didn't, we are all toast. So Hosea's unconditional love illustrates God's unconditional love for his people Israel. He will purchase her out of bondage and he will deal with her adulteries. And God is not done with his people. He's not done with Israel. Israel will not be gone forever. And God speaks to her again through his prophet Hosea. And God speaks to us through the same prophet Hosea. And when God speaks to us, what does he say? Well, he has to address a couple of things. God's people sin, and we're all often unfaithful to him, even as believers in Christ. We often put other gods before him. And the thing is, though, he's not done with us. That's why he speaks to us. And so he speaks to us. What does he say to us, and why does he say it? And so tonight... Um, as we've read in verse 9, God speaks to us in order to tell us that his ways are right. He speaks to us in order to tell us that his way is wrong or, or is right. <laughs> and by implication then, our way oftentimes is wrong, especially when God is telling us, by contrast, his is right. In a normal separation, there's usually enough blame to go around for both sides. But in God's case, he's perfect. Any separation must then be the fault of God's wife, his people. In Israel's case, it was all their fault. And so when God speaks to his people, he does so in order to tell us that his way is right and to call us 
to abandon our way and walk in his way. And Hosea uh, attached a postscript to the book to tell us that, that the whole thing was intended to tell us that God's right and that his way is right. And so in chapter 14, verse 9, Hosea says, who, who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but transgressors shall fall therein. Now why would God end this prophetic book by saying, P.S., I'm right and you know I'm right. <laughs> I mean, just think about if you've ever tried to reconcile a relationship that's usually not the best way to go around about it, right? You've had a spat with your wife and you're like, all right, now honey, let's, let's work this out. I'm right and you know I'm right, all right? And we know that doesn't work, right? <laughs> but we're not God. And God is the only one who can, who can speak so definitively this way. But he, why does he do that? Throws this PS into the, into the uh, fray here. I'm right, you know I'm right, and you better get on my path. And to answer that question, we need to know who Hosea had in mind when he wrote that statement. Hosea, the prophet, prophesied from about 755 to 710 B.C., and during, he prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah in Judah, and Jeroboam II in Israel. He, he identifies that in chapter 1, verse 1. And Hosea's long career spanned the last six kings of Israel from Zechariah to Hoshea. Now remember, uh, if, you, if you remember from Sunday school or just reading the Bible, uh, after Solomon was king of Israel... The nation split into two halves, north and south, right? Solomon's son, Rehoboam, um, he, he raised taxes, and that, <laughs> that's, that split the nation, right? Good idea. Uh, but uh, it's always a bad idea to raise taxes. But uh, anyway, Rehoboam ruled the southern kingdom of Judah, where the Davidic line, the Messianic line, the God-ordained line of kings were. Solomon's former servant, Jeroboam, became king of the northern kingdom, which split off and retained the name Israel. Hosea was a native of the northern kingdom of Israel, and he prophesied to Israel for 30 years or so. But, but Israel did not heed his warnings, and in 722 BC, God brought judgment on that nation. The Assyrian army, led by Shalmaneser V and then Sargon II, sacked the Israelite capital city of Samaria. They deported the population back east and then replaced them with Gentiles from another land. And that was their policy. That was the best way if you were conquering land to keep people, to keep regions from rebelling. Because now you've moved in people that they don't have roots there. And so there's not really a, a, a something to gel them in opposition. So refugees from, uh, from this war, when they sacked Samaria, refugees from that war flooded over the border uh, into Judah in the south. And, and when Hosea introduces this book, he dates it and he adds Hezekiah's name to that description. And he prophesied then during the reign, or he was active in ministry at least, during the reign of King Hezekiah, who came to the throne of Judah after the fall of Israel. So Israel was already gone when Hezekiah came to the throne of Israel, or of, of Judah. And so he may conclude from that information um, that Hosea was probably among the refugees who came across the border in, during that invasion and found sanctuary in Judah, probably in Jerusalem. And it was near the end of his life and his ministry in Judah that Hosea sat down and he wrote this book. So, there are two original audiences. One for the prophecies and one for the book. All right? Uh, the, the book contains the prophecies that Hosea preached to Israel. So, uh, when we read these prophecies, we need to understand, we need to consider Israel to be the original audience to whom the prophecies were preached. But then Hosea wrote those prophecies down while living in Judah, so we may consider the nation of Judah to be the intended original recipients of the book. Are you confused yet? Let me illustrate it this way. I have a five 
volume copy of Charles Spurgeon's sermons. And if ever you want to read some good stuff, there's some good stuff. And the sermons uh, in those books were originally preached to someone besides us, right? Um, they were originally intended for 19th century, century Londoners who were attending the Metropolitan Tabernacle to hear him preach. But the book itself speaks to me, a 21st century Midwesterner. Uh, and so Hosea's book reads like a collection, uh, a preacher's book uh, collect, uh, containing a collection of his sermons. And so uh, at the end of the book, there's a postscript that was not given to the people who listened to the sermons in the first place. Just like in my collection of Charles Spurgeon sermons, there's an introduction written by somebody else, not to the people of London Tabernacle, all right? Um, and so chapter 14 and verse 9 was not given to the people of Israel. That was given to the people of Judah who would read the book. Uh, and so that postscript is meant for them, for the reading audience only, for them and for us. And so Hosea 14, 9 is, is given to anyone in Judah who would pick up a copy and read, and for us also. And so now we, we, we know who Hosea had in mind when he writes these words in chapter 14, verse 9, who is wise and he shall understand these things, prudent and he shall know them, for the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall in them. He, he didn't say that to Israel. He said that to Judah. He said that later to us. Why? Why does the Lord tell us his way is right or his ways are right? Well, there are several categories of the concept of right. Uh, for instance, we might say that something is right because it's factually true. It's right, for example, to say that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? That, that's right. It's factually true. All right? There's another category. We might, we might say that someone is right because they predicted something and that came true. They were right about that. For instance, in, in our NCAA brackets, Tim picked Illinois to win their opening round game in the NCAA tournament. He was right about that. They won their opening game. Amen. All right, and I wrote this before anything happened today, but <laughs> and uh, that's what. Don't let me cheer for your team. That's what happens. But anyway, so that's a prediction that came true. So it's a it's right. But then we may say that something is right because it's morally good. It's right because it's just. And we, we say that it's right in order to express our agreement with its moral character or, or to justify its goodness in the eyes of others. For example, we may say that it is right for a Christian to be kind to others even when they have been wronged by those other people. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. So... Um, we, we may, what we mean is that it's morally good, it's just, it's right for a Christian to behave this way. In Hosea chapter 14 and verse 9, God inspired the prophet to justify the ways of the Lord. He's not only saying that God is factually true in, in being right. We, we would know that to be the case. And, and he's not saying that God necessarily predicted something and it came to pass, although God does do that. But he's saying that, that the way of the Lord is good, it's right, it's just, it's, it's morally good. Um, and he's saying that because he wanted people in 8th century B.C. Judah to agree to it. And he wants 21st century Christians in central Illinois to do the same. And so, now we're not going to get to it tonight, but right now sitting here comfortably in our in our auditorium it's easy to say yes to that all right it's easy to agree uh, but we're going to see why it was necessary uh, for for god to justify his ways to say he's right and we're going to see that it's not always easy to just nod our head and agree to that 
but that's going to be next week, all right? So you'll have to come back. Uh, the church is the bride of Christ, and, and sadly we sin and we get our eyes off the Lord, but, we, but, but praise the Lord, he, he is not done with us, and he, he never will be. He speaks to us through the prophets, apostles, and through Christ. And whenever God speaks, he tells us he's right, his ways are right. And so, now that statement brings up some important questions to me. Uh, but most importantly is this question, so what? Right, I was, um, uh, there's a, a, a preacher I like to listen to, his name is Stephen Lawson, if you ever, if you want to hear some really good preaching, uh, I know you'll have to leave here, but uh, if you, if you want to hear some really good preaching, uh, go on the YouTubes and, and type in Stephen Lawson, it will cost you everything. And it's a clip of about 11 minutes. And every time I want to just really get fired up, I listen to that. It's the end of a sermon. It's, it's just really good. But anyway, um, so um, there's my endorsement there for uh, somebody else, I guess. Uh, but uh, so, anyway, oh, I forgot where I was going with that. It's not in the notes, so I forget it. But anyway, he was talking about when he was learning to preach when he was in seminary and, and he had to preach in chapel and his homiletics professor was there. And he, he got up and left out the back door while he was introducing the sermon. And he came in a little while later as he's preaching, sat down in the front seat in front of everybody. Nobody could see what he had. He had a little whiteboard and he was writing on it. And, uh, and he was preaching and the professor held up the whiteboard. No one else could see it except for him. And he had the words, so what? Like, why are you telling us this? <laughs> and it changed the way he preached. And, and so as we look at this, God says that when he speaks, or when he speaks, he says that his way is right. So what? What are we supposed to do with that information? How are we to respond? And so tonight, there's three ways we need to respond, and we'll get the first one tonight. All right? The first one is this. We must rejoice that God speaks to us. This is, this is cause for rejoicing. God speaks to us. Most Christians take it for granted that God speaks to us. Uh, we have the complete Bible in our hands. Even Hosea only had bits and pieces of what we have. And he used it, by the way, uh, like crazy throughout his prophecy. Um, but we have more access to scripture than any generation has ever had. We are spoiled, especially us as English speaking people. Uh, today you can read the Bible in several good English translations. You, you were so spoiled. You can read your Bible from your phone. It's always with you. This has really helped as a pastor. I used to have to lug my Bible into the hospital, into places where I'm going to visit, or if I didn't have it, I was in trouble. And now I can just pull it out and, and I, can, I can go to town. I can read the Bible. And so we're spoiled. We're so spoiled that, that we can read our Bible from our phone and all that stuff. But unfortunately, familiarity breeds contempt. And what Christians in England were tortured to death for possessing so many years ago, um, it, it inspires so many Christians today just to only glance for a few minutes to ease their conscience. So let's rejoice that God speaks to us. That the God who created the multitude of galaxies, who holds together the atoms that make up our bodies, that God deigns to speak to us. The word of the Lord, verse 1, chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, Hosea the son of Beeri. The word of the Lord came and it, it didn't have to. <laughs> That's the thing, it didn't have to, but it did. And, and when we get done reading the book of Hosea, we might find it shocking that God would ever want to speak to his people the way that his people treat him. That God spoke to them is nothing but grace upon grace upon grace. And it's the same for us. That God would speak to us is nothing but grace. So rejoice. So be glad. Take joy. Take heart and comfort in the fact that God speaks to us, his children. The Christian who rejoices that the Lord speaks to us expresses that rejoicing in several ways. There's ways that we can rejoice and express that rejoicing. One is joyful repentance when corrected by God's word. Over and over again in the prophets, you will see God refer to his people as stiff-necked, as stubborn, um, and, and as rebellious people, 
And that is because when he would correct them, they would refuse to repent or they would fake repent. Like they would, they would say, oh, oh God, we're sorry. And, and, and because they were in a, they're in a pickle, they're in a, in a tight spot. And as soon as they got out of it, right back to their own ways, their old ways. And so joyful repentance when corrected by God's word. Um, I don't know about you, but I hate being told I'm wrong. The problem is I'm not always right. And so therein lies, the, there's the rub, right? I mean, it would be great if I was always right. Then, then I wouldn't even have to worry about if people told me I was wrong. I could just be like, ah, it's all right, I'm right, you know? <laughs> and, and there are people that go through life like that, unfortunately, but uh, that's not the way to do it. And, and the thing is, even when it's God telling us we're wrong, we don't want to hear it sometimes. Sometimes, though, when God tells us we're wrong and we repent, we find great joy in that repentance. It's hard to repent. It's hard to. Uh, see, repentance is not just saying you're sorry. It's not just being sorry. Repentance is a change of mind that affects you in this way, a change of actions. If there's no change of actions, then there's been no repentance. All right? And so when God's word corrects us, it's more than just saying, I'm sorry. It is, it is, yes, it's part of that saying I'm sorry, but then it is asking God and depending on God to change our actions. Most of the Bible is is pointed, uh, as far as dealing with us, is pointed at bringing us to repentance and dependence in faith on Christ. Read the book of Ephesians. Three chapters are all about how God has done all of this great stuff for us. He's made us one in Christ with all other um, ethnicities. We're bound together at the cross. He's taken down the middle of wall of partition. He's adopted us. He's predestined us to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. God has done this through the redemption that's in the blood of Christ for us. Us. And you get through all of that, he's elected us, he's chosen us before the foundation of the world, he's, he's saved us by grace through faith, created unto good, under Christ, by Christ for good works, dead in trespasses and sin, made alive unto Christ. You get through those three chapters and what's the rest of the, what's the, rest of the book? Here's all the things you were doing, now do these. <laughs> Quit doing that, renew your minds in Christ and do these. Let let him that stole steal no more. Um, uh, let not the sun go, be, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There's all kinds of stuff about repentance, calling us over and over and over again to repentance. That's how God works. And a Christian who rejoices that God speaks to us expresses that joyfulness in a joyful repentance when corrected by God's word. We express that joy also in frequent reading of God's word. Frequent reading of God's word. It's become a, it's become a kind of a, a, a popular thing, I guess, to denigrate the discipline of, of uh, Bible reading. To, to act as if that's pharisaical or superficial. As if that doesn't count as part of the Christian life. Or, or something like that. Or as if that people who read their Bibles regularly are legalists for doing so. And that's baloney. Now, if you think that you're scoring brownie points for reading your Bible, then you might be a legalist, all right? Um, but if you rejoice that the Lord speaks to us, then wouldn't you listen? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be happy that he is doing so? Uh, and so that would bring us to the point of frequently reading God's word. And I'm not one that would dictate how much of it you read or what time of the day you do that or whether you use a devotional or not. God works in, in different ways through us. I personally don't use any devotional or anything like that. But some of you guys, a lot of you guys used uh, the uh, features, which I think the new one's out. So that's on the back table. I'm putting those on the white table down there in case... 
it, we were running out of space, so I just put those down there. So pick up your features if you're, if you're. Uh, so I don't personally use those, but I know many of you do. That praise the Lord for that. Uh, I'm not one of those guys that says you here. I do it this way, and you all have to do it my way. Uh, not 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 like that. Um, but I would think that the Christian discipline of reading God's word frequently would would be an expression of joyful rejoicing in in his speaking to us here's another expression and that is a desire to share God's word with others if we rejoice that God is speaking to us we will desire to share that with others our men's group is uh, studying how to do that right we're, we're going through that one-to-one -one Bible reading we're learning uh, how we can share God's word with with other people and I I'm really uh, encouraged by by the attitude uh, of our of our guys with that it's been a blessing so far and uh, so a desire to share God's word with others I I saw that desire today in in, uh, in in brother Owens as he was presenting his ministry and his wife as, as she's with him and, and I'm sure she's ministering alongside in that mission field I see that desire in them and that call to to the mission field uh, and so that is that is something that not only can you do the time that God has given you, but you can give your whole life uh, to that in, in vocational ministry, a desire. If God speaks to us and we rejoice in that, it can be expressed in a love for the public exposition of God's word. What is that? Well, that's preaching, all right? Uh, and I'm not saying this to gin up more business, to say you better be here to listen to me preach. Uh, and and I, I'm, I, but at the same time, I love preaching. I love doing the preaching. I love listening to preaching. Why? Because they're sharing God's word. And God uses different preachers in different ways. He, I have a certain style. It's not the same as Brother Owen's style. It's not the same as other people that, that you've heard. And I'm glad that everybody's not the, the, the same way. Otherwise, that'd be kind of boring, isn't it? Wouldn't it? But the thing that needs to be done is the Bible needs to be preached as it is, not twisted into something else to say a different thing. But if the preacher stands up and says what God says, then we ought to rejoice in that. And I praise God that he speaks to you and that he speaks to me. And I want to express that joy and that, that uh, love for it in these ways. Now, God speaks to us, though, for a specific reason, and that is to tell us that his ways are right. And so what are we to do with that information? Well, first of all, we must rejoice that God speaks to us. And now... Um, we have to divide this sermon in half for the sake of time. And I've not really gone that long. It's not even 7 o'clock tonight. Um, but if I could, this is a nice dividing spot. And uh, if I go through the end of it, then eh, it could get kind of hairy. All right? So can't cover all of that. And, and so this is a good spot. But God speaks to us in order to tell us that his ways are right. We respond to that in several ways. And we've only really begun to scratch the surface of that. And our response has to be rejoice that God speaks to us. How are you rejoicing in this? In what ways are you expressing the joy that, that, that is in your heart about God speaking to us? Uh, let me try to explain uh, how we can take this response uh, past the moment of the sermon Pass the moment of the worship service. Take this response into practice for next week. All right? Uh, this week, a hundred, a thousand things are going to interfere with, with your time that you would spend listening to God speak. There's going to be stuff coming up. And I, I'm talking about, of course, the time you would spend in God's Word, uh, the time you'd, you'd spend in the church service, so on and so forth. And so take steps, make the decision beforehand that you're going to take steps to put away those distractions and put away those excuses. If you read your Bible in the morning, don't oversleep. Don't. You know how you oversleep? You hit the snooze, then you hit it again, then you hit it again. And then you wake up 30 minutes later and say, my alarm didn't go off. We always say that, but it did, all right? Now, there may be a legitimate time where your alarm doesn't go off. 
But if you hit the snooze 10 times, it went off, all right? Don't do it, all right? Then when you do get up, don't go on Facebook first. You know, I can, I can say this because I know the struggle. I wrote that part into the sermon on a day that I went to Facebook first. <laughs> All right? So I know. And you, and you think, I'm just going to check my notifications, right? You, you pull out your phone, and there's that little red number, and it says like five. Like five people have interacted with me. Since I went to bed last night, I have to know. And you click on that, and you don't check the notifications. You scroll. Why do you do that? Why do I do that? Stupid. All right? And I was calling me stupid, not you. All right? And uh, don't do that. Don't go to Facebook first. Take that time alone with the Lord. Because when you go to Facebook first, then your mind's already rolling. And you're, you're opening your Bible to the eternal truth. First John, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And you're trying to read that in the back of your mind is, I can't believe Nancy Pelosi did that. <laughs> right? That's all you're thinking about. Or that stupid ad that came across Facebook and you're like, I was talking about that product with somebody else and my phone overheard me and now it's showing me ads. And this is what you're thinking about. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So take these steps. I'm preaching to me too. I'm not just preaching to you. Start this on Monday and stick with it. Right? Stick with it. Make this your high priority in the morning. Some of you are night people and so you do that at night. I could never do that at night. I can't focus on anything at night and maybe this is proof of it. But let me just illustrate it with this. A husband and a wife are out on a date. They're, they're sitting in a booth in their favorite restaurant. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expensive restaurant. And, and uh, when they were dating, they, they would hold hands, keeping eye contact, sitting close together, whispering in hushed tones so nobody else would hear them and they'd be embarrassed. They would never be distracted by anything else in the whole restaurant when they were dating. In fact, back then, they couldn't even afford to sit in that nice restaurant. And they didn't care, because they were, they were together, right? They were probably at McDonald's or something like that. But now, sitting in an expensive restaurant, waiting on their order, they do not even hold hands. In fact, they hold their phones. And each is absorbed in their own screens, rarely making eye contact, rarely saying anything to each other. In fact, they are mentally worlds apart. One is sharing pictures of the kids on Facebook. The other is ranting about something on politics on Twitter. What a sad picture. God speaks to us. And many Christians, and, and, and sometimes, you know, I got to admit, sometimes it's me, are scrolling on Facebook, posting on Instagram, or finding a new idea on Pinterest rather than listen to him. And I'm not preaching against social media. I think there you should take really big precautions, but I'd be a hypocrite because I have Facebook. All right, I have social media. But I am saying that we often prioritize what is easy, what is stimulating, and it's very stimulating, and what is lazy over what really matters when what we should be rejoicing over and prioritizing is the fact that God is speaking to us. If he has to speak to you at 5 o'clock in the morning, then he should speak to you at 5 o'clock in the morning. If that sounds like a horror show, 6 o'clock. All right? <laughs> um, and so God is speaking to us to tell us his way is right, and we ought to rejoice in that. Let's stand together. And uh, we'll pick up the second half of that and uh, still, still working through even covering the main argument of the book of Hosea and haven't really even got into uh, the sticky stuff yet, but that's all right. So.